famous Amos, and I ain't talking about cookies today, right? Amos, book of Amos, pride aside, go to the table of contents, get a page number. Amos chapter 7, very significant verse. Amos chapter 7, verse 7 says, this is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord standing beside a wall built with a plumb line. You go ahead, what's a plumb line? What I'm holding, plumb line. With a plumb line in his hand, and the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will never again pass by them. I places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be, be made waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. God said, I'm setting a plumb line. Do you know what a plumb line does? Now, for those of you that are looking at me going, Ed, um, you got skinny jeans on, which means you don't know anything about construction, all right? So <laughs> thank you. And you're right, I don't. <laughs> so my wife has a cooler toolbox than I do, color-coordinated. For those of you that know anything about my wife, Stephanie, she may be a singer, looks real petite and cute, and she is. Amazing. But my girl for Valentine's Day a couple years ago wanted a chainsaw. My, my girl wants power tools for gifts, <laughs> and it's amazing. And so I married up. She knew what a plumb line was. I didn't know what a plumb line was. I had to Google it and YouTube it, and I talked to our facility manager. But here's what would happen back in the day. Now, we got levels and lasers that do stuff like this nowadays. But an individual would set a plumb wall, that plumb corner, and that wall would have to be set to this line. As the plumb wall or plumb line was established, the wall would now not lean in any direction because as the line of consistency was drawn, it would allow everything else to line up to what's called the plumb line. God said, I'm establishing a plumb line. This weight down at the bottom is called a plumb bob, plumb line. I'm establishing the standard. The standard does not change. The standard does not move. God says, I'm establishing a plumb line. Here's the target statement. To understand, here's the message, not just to dads today, but to all of us. To understand, we can not just make a living. God's called us to make a life. You can make a living and not make a life. And so we've been called to make a life. You go, Ed, I'd like to make a living too. Amen. But i like for us to make a life, to be able to pass on legacy. It's not what we leave behind. It's what we put in people that makes a legacy. God established the plumb line. Now, we're going to take a moment to look at Amos chapter 5, I want to give you four principles today. Number one, write this down. The plumb line that God has set for us is to know God personally. Know God personally. Amos chapter 4, or actually chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, would say, Seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel. Do not enter Gilgal or cross over to Beersheba. Now, those three locations were places that God manifested his presence. When you look at Bethel, that's where where Abraham would meet with God, get a word from God. Bethel means the house of God. When we talk about Gilgal, that would be the moment they cross over the Jordan River. They build a monument going into the promised land. And then when you hear about Beersheba, this would be Isaac. Abraham, Isaac, his son, would actually get a word from God. God would speak to Isaac at Beersheba. Three historical landmarks of God's presence. Now, in November, December, I'm taking about 400 people to Israel. And one of the things that will be so heartbreaking as I lead our church, 400 of us, on a tour to Israel. going to try to do these often because I want you to see where Jesus walked. The one heartbreaking reality about going to these places where Jesus walked is that actually they've turned into shrines and people worship the shrines versus the God that walked in those places. And this is what God's saying through Amos. You go to Bethel, you go to Gilgal, you go to Beersheba, but you miss the God that was in those places. You worship the monuments versus the maker of heaven and earth. I believe that you can know about God and not know God. You can be in the house of God and not, not know the God of this house. You can read the Bible and not know the God of the Bible. I believe a lot of people miss heaven by 18 inches. You go, Ed, really, 18 inches? How does that work? They knew about God in their head, but they did not know about God in their heart. So short, but so far. I meet people all the time that honestly will say things like this, like, hey, man, I go to church. I'm going to heaven. If that, if that reasoning was true, then I can go to Starbucks for seven days and become a Frappuccino. Y'all with me? I mean, I, I'm, is that, does that make sense? Chinchera, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, for real. Like, does that, 
Does that make sense to anybody else in this room? Some people all the time are like, I go to church. Well, if that's not true about Starbucks, it ain't true about, about coming to, you could come to church and miss the God of the church. And oftentimes, Amos was trying to correct this message that you know God, you know God, but God doesn't know you. You're not in a relationship with him. Point number two, write this down. Not only does the Bible say know God personally, but experience God, here's the principle, his sufficiency. Experience God's sufficiency. He who made Pallades and Orion and turns deep darkness into morning and darkens the day into night, who calls the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth, the Lord is his name. Amos was saying to the nation of Israel and the tribe of Judah, you have put your faith and your trust and confidence in your luxury. Last weekend, we talked about Joel. Joel, the locust swarms, devoured everything, economic hardship, inflation, all those things causing people to experience the judgment of God. Repent was the message. Now, the nation of Israel, living in prosperity, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. And Amos is saying, your exploitation of the poor Seeking not to be a blessing to those around you, you're failing to take in consideration that it's God that gives you his sufficiency. You can make a living and not make a life. That's the reason why I gave you that as a target statement. And Amos is saying, stop putting your, your trust in your stuff. Trust in God's sufficiency. There's a story about a father that was walking with his little girl and his little girl and father walking on a sidewalk and the stars were bright, big at night deep down in the heart of Texas, right? So, and there was a moment where all of a sudden she goes, Daddy, this is so beautiful. And she's looking at the stars, and she was so profound when she said this, probably six, seven years old. She goes, Daddy, if this is the wrong side of heaven, I can't wait to see the right side of heaven. What was she saying? Well, God's creation is beautiful. But she was worshiping the God who gave creation. Amos is going, you have made your worth, your value, your identity in the stuff and have failed to take in consideration the God who gave you those things. And God gave you those things, and this is what God's saying, and I believe it's a relevant message, that God has given you those things so that you don't just keep them, hoard them, and store them unto yourself. Do you know one of the fastest growing businesses in America right now? Somebody said it. Storage units. We got more stuff. More stuff. And here's what I need us to know. This sign that's in our house is a great reminder, and I believe it's a word over our house today. When God gives you more than you deserve, you don't build a bigger fence, you build a bigger table. Sometimes when God gives us more than we deserve, we try to create walls and fences of like keep out mine. And God goes, no, you have breath in your lungs because I gave it to you. I sustain creation and look to the stars. I know them by name. The sun rises, the sun sets, and I scoop up water from the ocean and put it into the atmosphere, and a rain cycle takes place, which, by the way, we need some rain. And so as we think about all that God is saying to the people of Israel, he's going, I'm your provider, which means that sometimes we cannot seek the Lord and seek stuff, and we can get stuff and not have God, and God goes, and you forfeit all of that stuff. And that was the message, experience God's sufficiency, that we serve a God that wants to be Jehovah Jireh in your life. And fellas, in this room, if you're like me, there is this calling on our life to provide and protect for our family. And we take great pride in providing. But as a father, I'm learning this more and more and more. So many times I tried to gift my affection. I know you've never done that before. Just talking to myself, hopefully this will impact somebody. I've tried to gift my affection. And my wife, and my wife has a tendency to sound so much like the Holy Spirit. Amen. Goes, Ed, what they really want is you. Like we did early Father's Day last night. It's, it's not the gifts. The notes that my kids wrote me were more meaningful than the gifts. And I believe all of us as dads go, yeah, that's true. Absolutely. And my hope and prayer is that we would not get caught up and trying to give all our family the, the stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that. We want to be providers, great value. But may we not do that at the expense of our relationship with God. Putting him first. Come on, I'm, I'm going to let somebody else clap with you. Yes, you're the only person that was clapping at that moment. And we're going to join you in clapping. Point number three. All right, write this down. Number three, serve God with integrity. 
Not only know God personally, experience God's sufficiency, serve God with integrity. Seek good, not evil, that you may live, and so the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have said. So when we talked about living in luxury, what Amos was confronting, historical context, they were actually getting wealthier, watch this, by exploiting the poor. Can't be bought, can't be bribed, can't be blinded. This is what Amos is talking about. We, we need men. We, we need people of God who cannot be bought, cannot be bribed, cannot be blinded. You go, Ed, why is that important to you? Well, in 1991, so I'm dating myself, but I, I, I gathered this article. It's entitled, The Day That America Told the Truth, 1991. What would you do for $10 million? Two-thirds of Americans participated in this poll. Listen to this. For $10 million, 25% of those that were surveyed would abandon their entire family. 25% would abandon their church. 23% would become a prostitute for a week. 16% would give up their American citizenship. 16% would leave their spouse. 10% would withhold a testimony and let a murderer go free. 7% surveyed for $10 million would kill a stranger. 3% would put their kids up for adoption. And, and we hear that and we go, what? Name of the article, the day that America told the truth. So why would I stand on a stage and go, we need people that cannot be bought, cannot be bribed, and cannot be blinded? Because people will sell out their soul for things of what I just read. Point number four, write this down. Not only do we know God personally, experience God's sufficiency, serve God with integrity, and live for God boldly. Live for God boldly. It's in Amos chapter 5, verse 23. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen. So the people of God are coming to the house of God. They're worshiping. They're reading the scripture. And God says, Amos, tell the people your songs I cannot stand. As to say, what you are singing does not match up to your lifestyle outside of the house of God. You ever heard of a guy named A.W. Tozer? A.W. Tozer said this, Christians don't tell lies, they just sing them. Can't say amen, say ouch. Because I'm telling you, I'm saying ouch right now. So many times, singing words that I'm not living out. What was Amos saying to the men especially? Proverbs 31 oftentimes is referenced to women. There's one verse in Proverbs 31 that gives a shout out to the dudes that her husband is known in the gates. My prayer for you men is that you would be known in the gates that your reputation would not be a reputation of you can be bought, bribed, or blinded, but instead that you would have hearts that are open to God's leadership in your life and you would lead those around you, especially our young men, that you would live a life that would serve the Lord, yes, in integrity, but live for God boldly, boldly not only in the church house, but bold in those places that God's called you to have influence over. Now, Interesting verse here, and I'll just close with this. Interesting verse here. As we talked about in Amos chapter 5, it says, Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like ever-flowing streams. Dr. Martin Luther King would preach from that, that we'd be people that see other people, that we would speak to those that have been marginalized, those that have been overlooked. I was speaking at this camp this past week in Alabama. There was a young girl that was a paraplegic in a wheelchair, about 16 or 17 years old. All of a sudden, she... She's wheeling up on me, and she's like, hey, Pastor Ed, so good to see you. I saw her last summer at this camp I was at, and I was like, how are you doing? So we interacted for a moment. I was like, hey, can you hop out of that wheelchair and jump into that seat? She was like, cool, into the seat. I sat down in the wheelchair and started doing wheelies, one-handed, in circles. She was like, how, how do you know how to do that? I said, um, I grew up in, an, in a government-subsidized housing unit, apartment complex where all my neighbors were Handicapped. My neighbor was a Special Olympic wheelchair athlete, and she taught me how to do wheelies in the third grade. And I'm almost 47, and I could still do wheelies in the in in services and hanging out in moments like this. And she goes, um, "You're the coolest pastor I've ever met in my life." I go, "Yeah, me too." All right, I, I think the same thing. I know that. Yeah. So, but she laughed. We laughed. You know what she said to me? She goes, "You see me." I go, "I can't unsee you." I grew up with people like you. And actually, I don't think you have a disability. I think you have a different ability. And it inspires me. It absolutely inspires me. And when we're a church that sees the unseen, 
you, you can't unsee that. You have a heart for the broken. Our church is built on the fact of diversity, multi-generationalism, and also we're a church for people in all walks and phases and stages of life. There are people that have been Christians a long time, and there are people like, hey, I just gave my life to Jesus two weeks ago, and I don't know anything about the Bible, and I'm here. There are even people in this room going, I'm taking steps towards Jesus. It's a slow step, but I'm here. And what we're saying is we're a church for all people, but we do not compromise God's word. We just say that there's a God that loves us right where we're at, but loves us way too much to leave us there because he's got something greater for us. And we're all fellow strugglers on this journey together, myself included, myself included. And so when we begin to understand what God's called us to be about, it's leveraging our influence to give value to other people. I know you believe me when I say this to you, but God's doing something here at CBC. We just bought this land. I'm just going to speak this into existence. I hope to see it in my lifetime. But in the process of caring for our city, residential housing for people that cannot afford to live on the north side. We're also creating real estate, real estate space up here for, for people to start businesses and create opportunities for job employment. I'm praying. I just want to say this out loud. I'm praying one day that we can have our own bank to give loans to people that can't afford home loans or have a business loan because of a past history. I'm praying that God will allow us to step into spaces that will change the city, one of which would be a space that will allow moms and dads who have special needs children to be able to drop their kids off at a space, thank you, mama, to be able to bless those, those, those houses of families that find themselves Caring for special needs children that go, I just need a break. I need a break. And we want to create a place where they can find respite care. So all of that, you go, Ed, this sounds like something more than a church. See, if CBC is just five services on the weekend, then there's so much more to church than just coming together for five services. But when we come together and we find ourselves inspired and we go, God, I'm in then we begin to walk in what God's called us to be about, which is changing this city for the glory of Jesus Christ. And not just this city, but the city, the state, the nation, the world. And God's looking for a group of people to pour his blessing on. And that's what I love about you, CBC. That's what I love about the fact that what God's doing is that we go, okay, so here's the plumb line. The plumb line, here's the plumb line. God goes, this is the standard. This is the standard. What is the standard? Know God personally, experience God's sufficiency, serve God with integrity, live for God boldly. That's the plumb line. You know what that was? The plumb line? That was the plumb line 5,000 years ago. It's the plumb line today. It's the plumb line for Latin America, plumb line for North America, plumb line for all the people in all the world. What's God say? My plumb line for you, my call of expectation, the standard, the consistency of my character that defines how you should build your life is know God personally, experience God's sufficiency, serve God with integrity, live for God boldly. He doesn't change that for people. Like he doesn't go, you know what, I'll just change that for you. Thank you guys. And I, I didn't plan on that happening, but man, amen. Thank you. God doesn't change the plumb line for people. Love you, Kath. God doesn't change the plumb line for people. He goes, nope, this is the plumb line. And I said it from heaven. And that's the line. And you have to ask the question at the end of a message, is your life measuring up? Know God personally, experience God's sufficiency, serve God with integrity, live God, live for God boldly. That's the standard. You go, if you're out here, God goes, come close to the line. This is what God's saying to us today. Now, watch this. Culture does not define the line. Politics does not define the line. Society does not define the line. Music does not define the line. Movies do not define the line. Popularity does not define the line. Social media influencers don't define the line. Well-known CEOs in the world, they don't define the line. God defines the line. God goes, here's my line for you. You want to know what I'm asking you? Know me personally, experience God's sufficiency, serve God with integrity, live for God boldly. That's the line. God goes, that's the line. How are you measuring up? You go, man, my life is jacked up. God goes, come on close to the line. Come, Come to this. God doesn't lower the bar of standard of his holiness. God goes, come to the line. And the good news of this is God, God gives us grace to do that. So let's just do this real quickly. Here's, here's the takeaway statement. In order to give life, you got to get a life. Get a life in what? In Christ. 
in Christ alone, in Christ alone. And so today, God's word is going forward. God's word is going out. My hope and prayer for each and every one of us today is that we would see the line and we'd move towards it. Heads bowed, eyes closed for just a brief moment. humbled by your generosity today. Obviously, just speaking that into existence has called some of you to go, yeah, I believe in it. I believe in it. When you you hear me pause for a second, I'm just... I'm asking the Spirit of God, sensing a shift, a shift. statement then I really want to speak to something real quickly. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's the greatest decision you could ever make. Talk to the person that invited you. Go to CBC Cares. There are all kinds of people that would love to tell you how to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. After the service, you can talk to our prayer partners. Our prayer partners will be here at the front. You can come talk to them. Prayer partners, I want y'all be ready for people that want to have conversations about how to receive Jesus. They'll be waiting. But I want to just say something because when this church, everybody look right here. Just, we're going to have to start the 121 service, Josh, a little bit later. So just, that's okay, all right? There was a moment, this church, six years ago, thank you, sister. We owed about $21 million in facilities, and I just felt led that God wanted us to owe nobody nothing so we could leverage everything that we have to to bless people and to care for people. And got a word from a sister that just said this to me about Uvalde. She said, Ed, I went up and served in Uvalde this week, and she said, everywhere I go, CBC is everywhere, like everywhere. Lemonade stand, CBC here. Like everywhere I go, CBC. She goes, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And so it, it's this heart that cares for the city, it cares for the broken, it cares for the marginalized, it cares for the needy. Times are hard right now. Your margin and finances is shrinking because of just gas prices and and it's real it's real and we're, we're taking into consideration how do we care for our people they need food they need gas how do we care for our people how do we come alongside of people and I remember when we owed 21 million dollars in regards to this building and we just went through some hard seasons there was a woman that walked from the top of the mezzanine She's actually the one who started this tradition. She walked from the top of the mezzanine. When, when I had to make a hard announcement, I was like, hey, I'm the brand new pastor here and um, we're $1.2 million behind budget. We're gonna have to transition off our team, 42 people, newspaper writes an article about me, church is falling apart, da 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 da. I'm at the top of the hill. I'm like, God, you sent me here to CBC to kill me. True story. Never, never battled anxiety and depression in my entire life until I came to the pastor of this church. And it's not your fault. That's, it's not, I'm not blaming that on you, my man. What's up, brother? But it was me that was like, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know. I don't. And God was like, radical generosity. Find a way to give it away. Just give it away. Give it away. And I'll just keep blessing and blessing. What we're staring at in residential housing, putting units out here for people. 
to allow them to, to have housing to where they could save up their money and buy their first home. Why is that a big deal? Because I remember living in government subsidized housing and my mom and dad saving up everything they had in our first house, $60,000, and it was run down, but it was all we had, but we were so proud of it. They couldn't get a home. And that first day was a big deal. We want to see people experience that. We want to see people that get jobs. I want you to listen to me. Right now, right now, there is, what's up, brother? There's an employee shortage. It's, it's not because, now there's a whole lot of complexity around this, but there are a lot of people that want to work, but their background checks don't check out and it's hardship. And we're going, God, send them here. Send them here. And we'll pour into them, disciple them, raise them up. And then all of a sudden, all these big companies will start calling us going, do you have some employees? And we'll go, we got the best employees. And we'd love to recommend them to you. So creating a job program for those that go, I want to get, I want a new start, but my background, and we'll walk with you and we'll sign as a reference. Think about this. Sign as a reference where somebody goes, come on, I'll shake your hand. Thank you, bro. Thank you. We'll sign as a reference and go, hey, they've walked here. And if they step out of line, we'll come alongside of them. The top of the hill. Counseling center. For people that cannot afford counseling. That will get counseling. <laughs> Prescriptions. Suicide rate has skyrocketed 200%. Because people going through all types of issues and challenges chemically can't get into their psychologist and they have to wait oh bless you they have to wait to get to their psychologist to get their meds right so we want licensed trained counselors with the ability to write prescriptions hey This is what we're, let me just tell everybody your name. Ava. Ava. How old are you, Ava? Eleven. Eleven. So I'm just going to end the service with Ava. Because she's really saying what I want to say. We're going to do some stuff, but this is the heart of it. Ava, would you say it in this microphone and get it? A righteous man not only gets back up, but he helps somebody back up. That's what we're trying to do. Amen. Proud of you. Come on. That's what we're trying to do. You said it a whole lot better than I could say it, I promise you. Ava, how about you pray us out? You know what it means to pray us out? You close us in prayer, and then you tell everybody to be dismissed. Okay? You want to do that? Yeah. Why don't you pray for us? Lord, I pray that everyone here, no matter what they're going through, that they can just come to you and you can provide them with peace, hope, mm. and the ability to, to step forward no matter how hard it gets. And I just pray for whoever's hurting in this room or just needs you, that you will come to them. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Tell everybody they're dismissed. You're dismissed. You're dismissed. Amen. Love you, 1145. Much love. We'll see you next weekend.